Good morning and welcome to the programme. Now, most of the newspapers and a lot of social media is awash with photos from a boozy Sunday lunch hosted by J.K. Rowling this weekend just gone. The Harry Potter author brought together a particular group of feminists and activists as a new campaign is launched called Respect My Sex ahead of the local elections. The women at the lunch, which included Professor Kathleen Stock, who resigned from Sussex University after a campaign against her views on gender and sex, uh, and also the campaigner, Maya Forstatter, who won, I'm sure some of you will remember, the first part of a case which means that gender-critical views are a protected belief under the Equality Act, are united over what they think defines a woman in a time when women's and trans rights are being debated. Well, today I'm joined by someone else who was at that lunch, the Labour MP Rosie Duffield, who has come into conflict with her own party's policies on this issue. The local elections are coming up, of course, on May the 5th, and this new cross-party campaign called Respect My Sex If You Want My Ex, set up by women's rights groups, is urging you as voters to ask several key questions, the top being, what is a woman? Followed by, what is more important, sex or gender? Followed by asking a candidate, as and when you may meet them, if you do, if they support single single sex spaces. Are those questions any of the ones that you would ask a local candidate? That's what I wanted to ask you today, a question about a set of questions. Do you care? Is that top of mind? Let's say a local candidate of any party comes to your door or you manage to speak to them, I don't know, at a hustings or in the local area where you are. Is this what's going to come up? Or is it more about the bins, dog poo, local transport links, the roads, the cost of everything in your life at the moment? Or if you do care about this, are you going to go there? Are you going to ask local candidates for their definition of a woman? Or if you are interested in this area, would the question perhaps be different? be about maybe their take on inclusion and trans rights. What are your thoughts on this campaign as the local elections come and where are you with the types of questions you would ask? You may think, I'm not going to see anyone. I don't even know how to get involved in this. But I want to hear if you are going to and if you are able to, what are the questions top of mind? Very interested to to get your take on this. But first, to Rosie Duffield, the Labour MP who's just joined me in the studio. She was at that lunch this weekend hosted by J.K. Rowling. A brief scan of her Twitter feed shows her having retweeted a photo of her and the author together with the caption from J.K. Rowling beneath it saying, two ex-single mums now united for women's rights. Rosie is a Labour MP for Canterbury. She came to prominence with her views over gender and sex in 2020 on Twitter when she posted in reply to Piers Morgan, no less a question, I'm a transphobe for knowing that only women have a cervix? Well, fast forward a year, she didn't feel she was able to attend her own party conference after death threats and abuse on the matter. And when her party leader, Sir Keir Starmer, was asked about the issue, he said it was wrong to say, quote, only women have a cervix. Rosie Duffield, good morning. Hi, Emma. Uh, those pictures, let's start there. There's this lunch that's gone on at the weekend, I believe on Sunday, a delayed Christmas lunch at yeah. quite a gathering of a particular group of women. What was that like? It was great fun. I mean, we've all been in contact for the last couple of years anyway and met in sort of different groups or singly, but we haven't all been able to come together. So it was really good fun to be able to do that. And, and the purpose of it? Um, just to say hello to each other and to celebrate, you know, that we're, we've got a great friendship, that we're supporting each other, what we've been through and to discuss this campaign and, and other things like that, really. And also, of course, the sharing. I mean, it could have been a, a private lunch. It obviously was a private lunch, mm. but it's been quite striking on the sharing of the images yeah. from it. You, you are a group of women who have uh, lived and breathed, I think it's safe to say, social media, mm. sharing, uh, using that space to share views. Yeah. Uh, what do you think that, that message is to send that image out? Um, I was really hesitant about doing that because I just thought, you know, we all know the kind of abuse that we could have got and perhaps have been getting. I don't know. I haven't been seeing that. Um, but I think the attitude at the end of the day was sod it <laughs> let's let's do this and let's just announce that we're sort of friends no matter what that we're still able to laugh and have fun we're just a, a group of ordinary women meeting up and doing what we do talking about the things that matter to us well were your particular group of women I suppose united mm. over some of these views that I was just outlining rather yeah. than you know randomly select yeah. it 
it would be a fair way of, of putting it. And, and when you when you say you were hesitant about sharing those sorts of images, was it a decision amongst the group? Um, JK has been posting a lot of them. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't have posted anything unless Jo had, and and she obviously decided that that was okay. Um, I think she's been quite vocal on social media in the last few weeks, and you know why not why not why should we you know it's oh i'm not built. saying either way you know, I, I, I know you're not. striking I, I think this is just what occurred to me you know why not and you know we as politicians we're so programmed to just accept or assume that we're going to get abuse and you hesitate before you make any decision like that so i'd put it on my instagram just a tiny little thing which has got a small following on my personal instagram and left it at that and then I saw it all over social media we were all getting calls from journalists all day yesterday asking the story about us must have been a slow news day I guess about us having lunch but um but yeah I mean we, we well did she's that. one of our most successful authors she has taken a, a stand on this particular issue from her point mm. of view and it is quite a group of it's a very accomplished group of women and also women who've been activists I suppose in the space for a long time it's not necessarily a slow news day it's, it's quite an image yeah yeah I understand people's interest and and, you know, but we were in that space, just ordinary women talking about the things that matter to us. And we're getting some uh, messages in coming in right now about what people do care about with regards to the local elections coming up. And I, I wondered, as you are supporting this particular campaign, which mm -hmm. I just want to stress at this point, uh, is cross party. Absolutely. And I should also say, uh, you know, if you if you need a list of the candidates or anybody available in your area, there's a full list on the BBC website. We're obeying all those rules in a run up to a local election. But what, what evidence do you have that people do want to ask these sorts of questions of local candidates? I've got personal direct evidence. So in the general election of 2019, one or Possibly sometimes two things came up on the door. Jeremy Corbyn, anti-Semitism, and in my area, Brexit. And the third thing that absolutely knocked me sideways was that I had three or four women stopping me, asking if they could have a private conversation. And what was happening in schools came up. Um, there was one woman who was a teacher, one was a social worker, one was a parent who said, I'm convinced that my child is gay, and yet there seems to be this kind of movement where... It isn't OK just to be gay. And that sparked a conversation. That's a, that's a different discussion. Um, but I was astonished that they felt they had to ask me in private to talk about these things. And that was before I had said a single solitary word in public or liked to tweet or anything. These were women who wanted to talk to me about that. And I was really surprised. It wasn't tax. It wasn't bins. It wasn't anything like that. It was this issue. Because, as I said, only two things dominated that election. From your perspective? Yeah. OK, so there's a message here that's just come straight in. I do not care at all about the definition of a woman. Let people live their lives. Poverty, injustice, climate change, corruption, war, children living in homes that do not have enough money to eat or heat their homes. These are the issues that directly affect women, not a trans woman needing the toilet. That's absolutely right. Some people don't care, you know, in quotes, about it, but an awful lot of women do. We can care about all those things. As a politician, that's what I do every single day. You know, in, in one day, we'll be covering fuel poverty, Ukrainian refugees and women's rights. You know, we can do all of those things at the same time. In terms of your party's position on these questions, what is a woman according to Labour? Um... That's a bit confusing, isn't it? I think it depends. Well, you're on a Labour MP. You... Well, I know what I think a woman is, which is a biological human adult female. Using the dictionary definition? Yeah. I I'm asking that, of course, because the thing that sort of said a lot of things in train uh, after my interview on International Women's Day with the shadow women's mm -hmm. minister, uh, Annalise Dodds, who was on the programme, I asked her about this. And I've got a, a range of, of quotes that sort of came after that interview. But when I asked her, she said there were different definitions legally and that it depends on what the context is Surely. You're chair of Labour's Women's Parliamentary Labour Party, I mm -hmm. believe, still. Yeah. What, what is the actual uh, line from the party on this? Um, I think it's been really unclear, I have to be honest. And I think now that I've heard Keir say that it is an adult human female, and I think Annalisa has since been clearer herself on that, um, but I mean, I'm an adult human female. I don't necessarily need my party to have a line on it that, you know, I'm an MP yeah, in that party. And that's what I think. You do need them to have a line. You've just well, you I'd support, like you support to. a campaign where you want people I'd like to, them to take some of the valuable time they've got with a local candidate and ask yeah. them this question. I would like them to have that very clear, simple, straightforward answer. I think most people, most women, 
just appreciate that kind of straightforward honesty rather than us umming and ahhing. So, so there isn't a line, you would say, at the moment um, from the party? I don't know. I'm not in the sort of inner circle of the front bench or the shadow cabinet. I don't know if there is a line. I'm not someone who as a backbencher reads the lines particularly, but that's my line. No, but you and are the chair like the of, if I was chair yeah. of Labour I mean, Women's I Parliamentary have asked the question. Party. Yeah. I've asked the question the a few has... times. It seems to be a bit confused. There's always a sort of slight uh, quantifying of that answer. And I would just like it to be stra- more straightforward. And in, in terms of Labour's official position around the Gender Recognition Act, mm-hmm. that it needs to be reformed is yeah. the position, but that also single space, single sex spaces need to be protected. Yeah. W- what is the issue with those two positions I think existing there, alongside each there other? There are questions on, I think Hisdama and Annalisa have said that they want to make it easier for people who transition to self-ID and also make sure that they reinforce their protection of single sex spaces and there is a biting point there where we do have to talk about both those things and how they can coexist. And do you have faith in the party that you're in to be able to do that? Um, I think we're getting there, the conversations are getting easier and I think they're starting to listen but it's a bit of a shame that it's taken so long and that hasn't been so clear from the beginning and that various groups haven't been heard or listened to who've been trying to talk about this to the party and within the party for at least three years. Okay, so because I suppose when I'm looking through what people have said recently from your party, um, you know, Keir Starmer has recently refused to answer when asked, can a woman have a penis? Yvette Coop has refused three times, uh, of course, a member of the, the shadow uh, cabinet refused three times to define what a woman is and says so she's not going to go down a rabbit hole in it. I've quoted what Annalise Dodds said on this exact programme. Mm. It, it does not sound like it is any clearer. That doesn't sound great, does it? I mean, I, I understand why individual people may not want to enter this arena because it is scary and we, we do get abuse. But as why a party... Is it, why is it scary? Um, I think because whatever you say as a woman politician, well, as a politician, you're kind of torn apart anyway. But this particular issue has been really contentious and there's a lot of hurt attached on both sides, a lot of very high emotion and feeling. Lots of people who are very invested in it get very upset if you accidentally offend them or offend them by not thinking about how you're speaking, but I wouldn't call it a rabbit hole. And, you know, my point of view is, of course, a woman can't have a penis. In that position, though, and in talking about that, you talk about feelings and people being hurt. Do do you understand why some trans people, trans women in particular, over recent days, where the Prime Minister has come out very clearly with his views, for instance, saying about uh, biological males shouldn't be able to play in female categories of sport. There's also been a double U-turn from the government with regards mm-hmm. to uh, conversion therapy, uh, leaving trans people uh, you know, available essentially to that therapy. Do you understand why some of those individuals do feel like there has been a change in mood and an attack? Yeah, of course they do. They have to really listen to what we're saying. Nobody I know or have met in this movement or in my party wants to um, leave trans rights, you know, on a bonfire or, or hurt trans people or make them disadvantaged. Absolutely no way. Imagine going through that. I can't. I, I could say that you probably can't as well. Um, it must be horrendous and scary, incredibly courageous to, to go through the public decision to change gender. I, I can't imagine how hard that is. But at the same time, what I came to politics to do was to protect women's rights, to speak about women's rights, to not shy away from speaking about women's rights. And that's my area of expertise, if you like. And I think the two can coexist. We just have to be able to have those conversations. I, I suppose it's also about the tone of it and yeah. it being respectful. I mean, I was just looking back at some of, of your activity on Twitter and, and you were investigated by party officials after liking a tweet by a US rapper. Is that right? Yeah. Curtis yeah, yeah. Tripp. The tweet said trans people are mostly heterosexuals cosplaying as the opposite sex and as gay. I think that was really unfortunate. I probably shouldn't have liked that aspect of the tweet. That's not really what I was liking. He was just yet another gay man that I'm connected to on Twitter who said that they found the term queer deeply offensive. And you know, I'm 50. A lot of people my age who I grew up with, went to pride with, who are called the word queer, I find it even hard saying it actually, find that really 
debasing, really um, insulting. It was spat in their faces. And I can absolutely empathise with not everyone embracing that word. It's, again, I mean, there's so many divides on this. This is an age thing, partly, isn't it? You know, newer, you know, younger people newer to this discussion on rights are probably embracing those words. But to people my age, it's still an insult and it's still deeply hurtful. And I think that's what Curtis meant. So I didn't mean to cause offence by liking that tweet, but I was agreeing with him that it isn't necessarily that straightforward. A message here, I absolutely do care about the issue of single sex spaces. I will be asking any candidate who knocks at my door, if we cannot name our sex, how can we organise and provide services for those who need them? Everything else comes from that, says Polly. Uh, Another one here, uh, my name is Philippa, Rosie is my MP. I have no cervix. I had a full hysterectomy five years ago. I want to ask why protection of women's spaces excludes trans women who are more at risk of violence or murder than any category. They need to feel safe too. Surely her wish is to protect women's spaces is to exclude violent, dangerous men. Why is the fear and the hatred projected uh, in this way? Uh, Why is the fear and hatred projected onto one of the most persecuted othered groups? What would you say to that? She's absolutely right to want to protect that group of people, and so do I. But we can't, we we have laws against rape, because the definition of rape is really that there's one thing that's used as a weapon in rape, and that is penises. Not every man is a rapist, but we have to have those laws. And not every biologically intact trans person, in fact, very few of them, I would imagine, are going to wish to harm females. But we have to protect people. We have to have these conversations. We're not ready to kind of decide that yet, I don't think. We've gone from 0 to 60 in a millisecond via social media. We have to be able to have those conversations and raise those fears without being called prejudiced or cancelled just for asking the questions. I don't know enough about this area. None of us do yet. We have to be able to talk about it. And yet there's nervousness about talking about it. Yes, yeah, because of being Are you nervous talking about and it labelled. Yes, completely. Yeah, I'm always nervous about talking about it. But because I've there's had, been personal cost. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, slightly persona non grata within my own party. Um, I know that I've been considered an embarrassment to the party by talking about it and they would much rather I didn't, you know, but I'm not going to because I didn't come here to necessarily just spout the Labour Party lines, I have thousands and thousands of women contacting me and men who are really concerned that we can't just have this conversation. That's what it's about. You've been called and other sex-based rights campaigners have been branded dinosaurs by colleagues in your party. That was the comedy gift that keeps on giving. I mean, you know, David Lammy is a friend and I, I don't think he saw that coming at all. But, you know, I've been sent lots of dinosaur brooches and badges and people dressing up as dinosaurs. And I've got a T-shirt of me and Joe Rowling <laughs> dressed as dinosaurs. You know, I mean, it's I don't think it was meant the way it came across. But but persona non grata in your own party, mm, you're slightly. still chair of Labour's Women's yes. Parliamentary Party and you don't seem to agree with what your leader is saying, you seem to agree with what Boris Johnson is saying. I think Boris was really clear. He was asked a question in PMQs a couple of Wednesdays ago, and he's obviously been really thinking about and reading about this issue. And or weaponising the culture war. Well, maybe he is weaponising it, but then why have the Labour Party allowed it to be weaponised? I you don't know. know. That's, that's your strategy. You keep losing elections. <laughs> it's not my strategy. At all. I'm not involved in the strategy. I'm just a mere backbencher. But, you know, I think I did try and warn the party that this was coming. And I think the feeling was that it was a niche issue that it would go away why it hasn't gone away well well, some are also saying this is an incredibly niche issue it's not to the thousands of women that contact me i know but i also we have millions of listeners and i also have to respond i mean i got a message the other day saying that somebody didn't even understand one of my interviews that i've done on this because they can't follow some of the lingo on it you know there's a lot that people have to get their heads around why are you still an mp for the labor party um I believe in the Labour Party as a movement. It's never just about the state party. You've just denigrated the previous leader and you also don't agree with this leader on what you say is one of the most important issues at the moment that isn't a niche issue. So why are you staying in a movement that has made you a person, you know, somebody that's not somebody who's respected or valued? I think it's not just a party or a movement for the few at the top. It is the biggest party on the, of the left in Western Europe. There's something like 500,000 members. I'm here to represent my constituents and the members that I know are really engaged in this issue. That's women councillors, people who signed what we call the Labour Women's Declaration, which is a group within the party. But you're of, stand, of but you're stand, of women. No, but I understand all of that, that it's big, right? Mm. But you're standing there under a banner, yeah. under a leader 
who won't say if a woman can have a penis or not. And you are at odds with that position. Yeah. Well, there are lots of women like me within the party, councillors, members, and some MPs who agree with me. So and we're hoping to shift the position, I suppose. So what, So you would never join, you would never resign from the Labour Party over this? Um, I have to be honest that I've thought about it. I'm not in that space yet. If a woman like me, who's a single mum, on the tax credits created by the last Labour government, is beginning to doubt my allegiance to the party, and I am a typical Labour voter, then I think probably the Labour Party need to listen to that. But but you've been doubting it for some time. I suppose that's what I'm saying. And if there was a moment to go to the Conservatives, it's now on this issue. There are lots of issues for me personally that mean I couldn't just join the Conservative Party. Immigration, Brexit. All right, and, and, and any other party then? Have you um, thought about There are no other parties that appeal to me in that sense. And if you look at all political parties, the main ones have a huge broad church of views. And that's great. You know, there, I'm not the only Labour MP who feels like I do about this issue. I, I suppose where I... Th- and, and my experience of, of talking to MPs and talking to those who work in politics is that where sometimes listeners don't understand and the public have asked a lot of questions I've seen over the years is when they hear an MP come on who does not agree with their party and their Mm. party line does not agree with their leader of their party on the issue that they say they care and are campaigning on and are most vocal about and yet they continue to stay a member of that party why not do the brave thing and resign the Labour Party right here right now on Women's Hour I absolutely completely understand that point of view I had similar over anti-Semitism which dominated from the day I was elected to the 2019 election and and a bit beyond and people used to say to our Jewish women MPs why are you still in the Labour Party there are lots of personal reasons everyone has to answer to themselves as well as their constituents and their local party but for me I don't believe the conversation has ended I think it's just started I think there is a shift I'm hoping to be part of that conversation changing I know there are plenty of women in the party who think that this is still the party for them we just need to change on that I've seen a change over anti-semitism if I hadn't I'd have been out of the door um well, you saw a change the electorate didn't go for Jeremy Corbyn no they didn't and we absolutely deserved that on that issue well, it won't I necessarily really be about that. just about that issue of course it may have also just liked what the conservatives and well, Boris Johnson as well were. but, no, but the point is you didn't yeah. affect that change I suppose I'm saying with the experience of what happened with with Jeremy Corbyn from your perspective mm. You didn't affect that change. He he ran in two elections and it was the public that dealt with that from that perspective. And I suppose how confident are you, just as our time comes to a close, how confident are you that you can change the Labour position to get it to a place where it can make the definition of a woman as you see it? I'm quite confident that the groups within the party are now starting to be heard and listened to. I don't know whether I will be personally, but I'm going to keep trying and keep fighting. At the end of the day, I have to keep checking myself if it's the right thing to still do. One what, day what, the answer might be different. What, what, would that, what would be that day? Have you, got a, um, have you got a kind of thing in your mind? I think it partly depends on the policies we go forward with into the next election, actually, and the, the, the lines that we're told to say. If I absolutely fundamentally disagree with them, I'll have to be honest and say so. Do you still like politics? I love politics. My everyday job is brilliant. It's what I always want to I think it's, to always, it's always good to check in with MPs <laughs> on that point because, as you say, you, you have the campaigns that you go for and there are a lot of things that go on behind the scenes because of that. And you yourself have, have talked about some of uh, the abuse and the threats. I know you've talked at length about that. So today was you know, a bit more of a chance to hear about some of the policy side and the ideas behind it. Rosie Duffield, thank you very much.